Welcome to Zambition, the channel on which we engage in dialogue with leaders from across sectors and generations. Greetings and welcome to Zambition. My name is Martin Kalungubanda, your host on this channel. This is our first dialogue since Zambia went to the polls on the 12th of August, ushering in a new government. And our guest is a scholar, an academic, Dr. Grieve Chelwa. Dr. Chelwa is the inaugural postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Race and Political Economy at the New School in New York. There, he leads the Institute's work on inclusive economic rights. His academic credentials include having been a senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town, he has been a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for African Studies at Harvard. He has been a fellow at Witts Institute for Social and Economic Research at the University of Witwatersrand. He comes with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics from the University of Zambia and a PhD from the University of Cape Town. Before his academic career, Dr. Chelwa was a banker, a banker with Citibank and served in a number of African countries that include Congo, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. Dr. Chelwa, welcome to Zambition. Thank you so much, Martin, and thank you for inviting me to be a guest. I have followed the, the, this particular series and I've learned so much from it. I consider myself very lucky to be a guest. We are lucky to have you on the program. And I will begin by asking you to share with us an image or describe an image that best reflects who you are and the journey you have walked so far. What would you say are the two to three most defining moments in your life? Uh, thanks for that question, Martin. Um, I mean, when I think about an image that describes who I am, I think of a bird, right? A bird soaring in the, you know, above ground, uh, and then also a bird that overcomes the sort of the opposing resistance of wind, Right, so it's flying from place to place, and uh, sort of uh, is either guided by the head headwinds or sometimes flies against the wind. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the a bird is migratory in nature, so it uh, flies from place to place, which in many ways describes uh, when I think about my life over the last 15, 16 years, moving from place to place in that kind of way. Talking about the defining moments that I think of as the defining moments in my life. I mean, the first one is meeting my wife, <laughs> who uh, I've known for 15 years. Um, mm -hmm. Her name is Mwansa. Uh, she's really been an incredible influence on my life. The, the path that my life has taken, the person that I have become. I also think about the birth of our children together. Right? We have two children together. Uh, the birth of those children has really been also a defining moment in ways that one cannot describe, you know, in, in, in language. And the last one is, I think, going to the University of Zambia. I've never forgotten that first day in lecture theater one at the University of Zambia and uh, realizing for the first time that this is a place where one is free, is free, to, free to think, right? So I think of those as the defining moments, Martin. How did you meet Ramwansa, uh, uh, if I may ask? It's a, it's a very interesting story. Actually, I said I've known her for 15. Now that you asked that question, I realized for mm -hmm. a little bit longer. I used to be a librarian at David Kaunda. That's the high school I attended in Lusaka, David Kaunda Secondary School. And uh, I was in grade 11. 
and she had come as a grade 10 because David Kounder in those days started from grade 10. And uh, we were assigned, she also came, became a librarian and we were assigned the task of looking after the general reference uh, section in the library. So we had to do stock taking at the end of every day, count the books and that kind of stuff. In that activity of getting to count the books, you know, we got to know each other and we became friends, right? We became friends. And then she then subsequently went her own way after high school, I went my own way. And then we reconnected at the University of Zambia where we started to date. So we met in the general ref section of the library at David Kaunda Secondary School in Lusaka. <laughs> Thank I, you. Yeah, this makes me realize I should take a bag there for a date one day. I should take a bag. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> mm. And then um, you said um, that lecture theater at the University of Zambia. Could you say more why that was a defining moment? It is. It's, that's a, it's a fascinating day. So the first class I ever attended at the University of Zambia was Development Studies 101, DS 101. And it was taught by Mr. Chivale Mabwe. Mm -hmm. And he basically, first of all, he taught us about his story studying in the UK. And he went, he went to the University of East Anglia uh, for graduate studies, postgraduate studies. Then he, he talked about development. Then he began to tell us why development is so important to study. As well, it's always important for a country like ours. And just the whole discussion was very fascinating for me. Just the knowledge that this gentleman had, how he was dispensing it, and how he was also taking our own knowledge, however premature, quite seriously. This for me was just so fascinating. There was, it appeared to be a very nice democratic space. You know, something that was different from the high school setup where the teacher is really the autocrat of the classroom. This was different. <laughs> you know, yeah. Mr. Mabwe was really engaging us in dialogue and really exposing us to all, all sorts of new ideas. And that was fascinating for me. I do remember Dr. Mabwe. I do <laughs> remember how he would come there and making you wait to listen to the next lines he was going to say. And, and, and almost like he was standing on holy ground. He wanted you to connect with what development felt like and what it would take to get to the world of our dreams I, I i do remember those those moments as well yeah yeah that's true that's true and uh, what was also exactly I, you've described him very well and i don't remember him coming with any piece of paper right he would speak from his heart and mind <laughs> yeah. for uh, for an hour lecture <laughs> non-stop absolutely, and absolutely. taking uh, lecture notes <laughs> no. yeah, uh, fascinating fascinating times yeah and coming to this moment dr cherwa zambia has done it again we have managed to transition from one government headed by one political party to another, and to do so with relative peace, almost stunning political players from all sides that Zambians can wake up and rein back their power. What are the key lessons that we should never forget as we reflect on the past 10 or so years of the Patriotic Front leadership and government? Uh, thanks for that question, Martin. I think you hit one lesson on the head in the, in the way you set up the question, that the big lesson from this is that ultimate power resides with the people. In a democracy, ultimate power resides with the people. And I think we should never forget that lesson. It seems to me in the last 10 years, in some moments, we tended to forget that particular lesson. Right, I think that's one lesson that we should never forget, even going forward, that ultimate power resides with the people. The people are the ultimate uh, employers of uh, <laughs> people in political office. We should never forget that. Um, the other thing that we should, uh, the lesson to, to get from the last 10 years is really, it's very important, it seems to me, to know who your leaders are before they become your leaders. Right? It seems to me we forgot that. We forgot that aspect of uh, what one may call uh, due diligence. We forgot to perform some due diligence on some 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 of our leaders, and I think we didn't we didn't know who who they were, where they were coming from, what their ideas are on on issues of 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 of, of government governance and those kinds of things. This lesson is very important, even as the new the president elect thinks about putting together his team. 
I think it would be very useful for us, even when he announces his team, it would be very useful for us to scrutinize those people he, whom he has appointed and uh, to offer commentary uh, one way or the other. Especially, I'm very excited to see the young people who are engaging with him on social media. So I can see that as one avenue where the, the young people will be able to say, uh, Your Excellency, this was a great appointment. This was a bad appointment for these particular reasons. I love the way you have used the term due diligence. It is something that never occurred to me in that way. When we are borrowing money from a bank, they do due diligence just to know who they are lending money to. When we want to enter into partnerships that really matter, we do due diligence. We check around who it is that we are lending money to, who it is that we want to partner with. And we may not have paid adequate attention looking at people we are handing over to significant authority in the running of our government, in the management of the state of affairs of our country. Thank you for underlining that, that, that line when you said due diligence. We might not have known the so many people who constituted the government that has just been kicked out. And I love the fact you are saying we should never let our guard down, mm -hmm. even as the new president, mm -hmm. the new cabinet sets mm -hmm. out to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very important. Super, super important, I think. Yeah. Thank you. And at the same time, we can't ignore, and you have alluded to that, there is pressure pressure on our country and the new government to do good. And part of what that doing good might imply is to return to good books with the IMF and the World Bank. Some development experts say, yes, we are in deep trouble with the much debt that we all and have accumulated as a country. And at the same time, the IMF and the World Bank, some people say, do not have a very good track record as development partners on the African continent. How should Zambia relate to these institutions? That's a very, very important and difficult question. I think this is going to be a question that has to be at the full, full mind of the new, uh, the new administration. Right, what to do about our debt, what to do about the IMF and World Bank, and what to do about sort of other sort of geopolitical powers in the world. Uh, you're right, our relationship with the IMF and World Bank as Zambia in particular, and as the African continent, and even as what uh, people refer to as the global south, has, been, has not been, has not been um, one that has been smooth sailing. Right, uh, there was a period in the 80s and 90s when the IMF and the World Bank were at the sort of at the vanguard of uh, uh, pushing for policies that we have now realized were quite disastrous on so many levels, you know, in inequality. In the Zambian case, you know, Martin, the privatization of many of our state-owned uh, assets and parastatos led to large-scale misery in many parts of the country, right? Um, so this, certainly the IMF and World Bank come with that kind of baggage. But uh, it also turns out that given the way the world is structured economically, right, it is very difficult to not do business with the IMF and the World Bank, in inverted commas. So the newer administration has to sit down with the IMF and the World Bank. You know, they sadly, well, one may call it sadly, or unfortunately, it's the way the world is. They come with a clock of credibility. You know, when they do business with you, when they sit down with a particular country, everybody else, everybody else takes that country seriously. That's the way the world economy is structured today. We might, stru might be structured differently in the future. But that is the way it is structured today. And it seems to me, even though I myself am a very big critic of the IMF and World Bank, it seems to me that over the last decade or so, when one reads some of their reports very closely, they have begun to move even their own ideology. They care about inequality. They care about poverty. They have said sorry one way or the other. You know, they have said sorry for the 90s. Uh, you know, they've done a mere cup of one way, one way or the other. So I think the new administration has to engage with them. But we need to engage with them with the lessons of the past. We need to say, look, 
uh, IMF were not going to engage in austerity like we did in the 90s, because it really annihilated families, annihilated communities, annihilated townships, annihilated whole sectors of our economy. We're going to do it differently and do it on our terms as, as best as we can. Thank you very much. In the past, when our engagement with the IMF did not work so well, mm -hmm. what could you attribute that to? Is it because we couldn't negotiate as equals? Is it because we couldn't explain the predicament of our citizens? Could it be that we didn't know that there was an alternative that could be used as an argument of how you revive an economy without letting some people sleep off, mm -hmm. literally die, or mm -hmm. get eliminated from the economic map. What was it that explained the manner in which we engaged with them? I mean, that's a fascinating question. That is a very complicated one as well. Um, when one looks at the debates in the 80s and 90s leading up to the adoption of uh, structural adjustment uh, programs, I think we knew that structural adjustment programs went their way to go about things. I mean, there's some evidence, for example, our late president Kenneth Kaunda in the 80s would, I think he implemented a SAP-like uh, policy in the 80s and then reversed immediately when he saw that things weren't working. So we had that kind of knowledge. But the 90s were a very different time for us. We had kicked out the UNIP government. We had elected an MMD government that was elected particularly, I mean, there, I, I've watched videos of Frederick Chilova, who be, the, uh, the man who became president, talking about Adam Smith, talking about the, the wonders of the free market economy and those kinds of things. So in the 90s, even globally, the ideology that seemed to have won was neoliberalism, right? So this is the ideology that seemed to have won in the world. You would have, to be, have been crazy because the evidence was there. We tried this other thing, but look at where Zambia is today. So let's try neoliberalism. So one, 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 one answer to the, to the question is that neoliberalism seemed to have won, right? And there was a whole industry that was then built up on the back of neoliberalism. You know, our economies were trained in neoliberalism, neoliberal mindsets and those kinds of things. But also it came with lots of tax dollars, right? Because it won, the IMF and the World Bank began to subsidize the idea itself, right? So it is not the case, I think, that our people didn't have the capacity to, uh, to put forward an alternative. It's just that it was so difficult in the 90s. I mean, even, even if, I, if, I were, if I were an adult in the 90s, an adult in the room in the 90s, even for me, it would have been difficult. Right, because we're going against an idea that seems to have won, right? Yeah. The Soviet Union had just collapsed, <laughs> yeah. which was what many people thought of as the alternative. But that just collapsed, right? Uh, so this is this is just the 90s. It was this era where uh, arguing for an alternative was just very difficult. Now it's easy to argue for the alternative because we have three decades of evidence to show that it didn't work. So that's how I would put it. I mean, I think we should be very kind when we try to assess our leaders who were there in the 90s. Right, very kind to them because it was also very, it was a different time, <laughs> and uh, in, was, exactly yeah. So in that in that era, yeah, uh, you couldn't argue against um, the notion that Adam Smith's invisible hand will sort things out. Mm -hmm. But now with time, we know yeah, that yeah. on its own, it doesn't solve everything. Correct, Doctor Chelwa. Yeah. Yeah, we'll please. take a little break. And when we return, among many other questions, I'll ask you what your ambition is. One of the ways to unlock the country's potential in science and technology to embrace mathematics and that's why the Center for Mathematics Excellence has been created to enhance mathematics in the country. At the Center of Mathematics Excellence we demystify mathematics. For example, I'll show you how to simplify a simple equation like this one. x plus 6 is equal to 10. We simply subtract 6 from both sides to obtain x plus 6 minus 6 is equal to 10 minus 6 
and x is equal to 4. That's how we simplify such equations. Welcome back. Our guest today is Dr. Grieve Chelwa, an economist, but also someone who comes from the applied side of the economy, a former banker. Dr. Chelwa, my next question is around the concept and practice of or application of GDP, gross domestic product. This has been used as a measure of economic development, but we remember that it was created only in 1934 when some economists uh, such as yourself were writing a report to Congress. Even at that time, the lead economist and the lead author of the report, Simon Kuznets, did warn that GDP should not be used as a key indicator of economic success. That has been ignored. GDP is now a magical number. However, people like me who are not economists would argue it doesn't always count the right things. If we use it as a way of evaluating the performance or lack of economies, there are certain important aspects of economic life that are not counted in the current measure of national performance, such as unpaid work done by our mothers and women. And there are many other variables that I would say are not incorporated in GDP. As an economist, Dr. Chelwa, what would you whisper in the ears of our new president and our new minister of finance in regard to what we should place value on in our economy as we move forward? Uh, Martin, you always ask the best questions. Um, you are right. I think uh, ever since GDP, the concept of GDP was first proposed by Kuznets and others, it has become, you're right, become this magical number, this only number that we should focus on in uh, assessing whether our economic life is performing. Um, certainly, it has got its problems, and you've highlighted some of it. It doesn't count some very valuable things as economic activity, care work, I mean, work in the, in, in, in the household, raising families, raising children, some of the most important thing that you can think about. There can't be anything more important than raising children who become the leaders of tomorrow, the workers of tomorrow, the scientists of tomorrow and that kind of thing. It also, it also doesn't uh, uh, factor in a destruction to the environment, for example, mm -hmm. right? In trying to produce minerals, uh, which add on to GDP, we're destroying the environment, right? And it also counts certain things, like maybe, you know, one may so you say the brewing of alcohol or the, you know, growing of tobacco, <laughs> all those things. Those things are also captured in, in GDP. You're right. But if I can defend it to mm -hmm. an extent, I will say it turns out that in moments when GDP goes up, right, we also tend to see at least some improvement in the quality of life of people. Now, this relationship is not exact. It's mediated by policy. This is where policy can, becomes very important. Because for example, one decade in recent memory where GDP performed very well, 2000 to 2010, during the administration of uh, Mr. Levy Monawasa, we had GDP growth rates of about 7% on average per annum. And this is a period that also uh, one may say uh, coincided with some improvements in the economic life of people. I was a recent graduate, I entered the job market during that era I had multiple job offers, and these stories were quite similar to many of my friends around me. So GDP certainly, it gives us a pulse, but not a very good pulse, and you're right. I think what we should be aiming for as a country is to improve the dignity of our people, right? We need to improve the, our people should live dignified lives. And that is where the policy uh, comes in importantly, right? 
if the mines are producing so much copper and it's adding out to our GDP, what are we doing from that bounty, right? To try to improve the uh, dignity of our, of our people, right? So this is what I'm saying. And I think, the, so the one, the one thing that one might whisper to a president and to a minister of finance, I would say in addition to collecting data on GDP, can we then begin to collect quite seriously other data points that drive towards this aspect of dignity, right? For example, what is happening to minimum wages, right? We need to collect this data quite time, yes, right? Perhaps on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, what is happening to minimum wages? What is happening to unemployment rates? What, it ha what is happening to job creation? What is happening to the quality of jobs that are being created, right? So I think these are the things that I would whisper to the Minister of Finance and the President. We have the infrastructure, we have, uh, now it's called the National Statistics Agency. It's no longer the Central Statistics Office. So it's the National Statistics Agency. It has to be able to collect this data. What's happening, for example, to uh, childbirth? You know, what's happening to maternal mortality? These things we need to collect on a time year basis because all these things, the sum total of them results in what I'm talking about, dignity, people living dignified lives. That's the objective, I think. So this is the kind of, uh, if I had that opportunity, Martin, I would whisper these kinds of things to the minister and the president. Let us collect, in addition to GDP, can we collect indicators that we consider good for dignity, right? Quality of jobs, types of jobs, types of compensation, types of uh, benefits at the workplace, uh, leave, all these kinds of arrangements is what I would do. I love what you are hinting at. I love what you are touching on. Dignity. Uh, you remind me of uh, GNH uh, for Bhutan, Gross okay. National Happiness. In yeah, Bhutan, yeah. they are seeking to measure yes. or to assess their performance, not in terms of GDP, uh -huh. but in terms of GNH, Gross National Happiness. And when I hear you talk about dignity i'm hearing you say maybe we could develop a system of measurement that is called gnd gross national dignity because you are right my dignity goes up or yeah. low mm -hmm. because of my access to education health yeah. Mm -hmm. whether I have access to decent housing, yes. whether I can rest, exactly. whether I can have some level of peace that allows me to be creative. Mm -hmm. Dr. Chelwa, you are <laughs> onto something exciting there. Gross well, I, don't know, I like that. <laughs> and that is what we've been aiming for. When we say we're going to develop the country, that for me, that idea means we're going to raise the dignity of our people. I'm getting excited about the notion of dignity. And uh, where did the, where did you get this from? How did you come up to start thinking of dignity as an important way of measuring progress or lack of it of a country? I, th I think the source for this was sort of in various places. Uh, I read a book recently by Gene Sperling called Economic Dignity. So Gene Sperling was a uh, uh, Barack Obama's one of Barack, the chair of Barack Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, which is sort of in the White House. This is the entity that's responsible for advising the president on economic affairs, was counselor to the president for economic affairs. And uh, Gene has this, uh, talked about how dignity was an aspect of how they did economic policy in the Obama White House. So, for example, the Affordable Care Act, which is uh, uh, colloquially known as Obamacare, right? The Affordable Care Act, which wanted to extend insurance coverage to may, millions of Americans who didn't have insurance coverage, was an aspect of dignity. And this is important because the U.S. is supposed to be the richest country in the world, right? But when people like Gene thought about it, it doesn't deliver dignity. The richest country in the world does not uh, provide dignified lives to a majority of its citizens, right? Uh, so for me, this idea of dignity is then linked to the idea of development, right? I think of itself as a, a developed country is one that gives, provides dignity. And this is why Western Europe, for example, the Scandinavian countries are very attractive because their level, their, the idea of development there is an idea of dignity, granting dignity to your citizens, right? So this is how this idea of dignity, for me, this is development. When we say we want to develop Zambia, I, I hope we mean we want to make sure that our people live dignified lives. 
And what is interesting is that it is also a key word in our national anthem. Dignity features prominently in our national anthem, but also in many of our languages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For instance, pardon me for probably not knowing many other uh, alternatives in the many Zambian languages. In Bemba, ukuchindama, uh, you don't chindama mm -hmm. if you don't have a job. Mm -hmm. You don't chindama if mm -hmm. you can't take your child to school. Uh -huh. You don't chindama mm -hmm. if you don't have your own place you call home. And, and, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm finding fascinating about your concept here. Okay, no, you're right. I didn't even realize it was in our national anthem. I mean, I've sung that, I've sung that song, obviously, unconsciously so many times. <laughs> You know, from a, from a kid, but you're right about Ukuchindama, right? And many other languages have this idea of dignity. Because that's what it's about. You know, we don't want we don't want people walking around without rag torn clothes on. We're very particular about saying cover them, restore their dignity, because that's what it's about. So a a development plan or strategy has to have dignity as the ultimate goal. Then we've developed. <laughs> you Fantastic <know>. development. <laughs> Yeah. Dr. Chelwa, what is your ambition? What is your highest aspiration for our country? I think I might have hinted on it. My highest aspiration for my country is for my country to be able to give dignity to the 18 million Zambians. Lives where they can be counted, lives where they're included, lives where you know their opinion matters, whatever their level of education, whatever their position in life. That for me is my, my highest, my ambition, right? And one mechanism of that is development, a right, a right way of doing development. But that is my ambition, uh, Martin. Fantastic. And what will it take yes. to attain that level of dignity for all the 18 million and soon to be more Zambians? I think it's a lot of work, right? I mean, the what we know, and I think you hinted at that, what we know is that you need resources to be able to, to provide dignity, right? to be able to provide decent housing, decent health care, these kinds of things. Uh, you need resources. So we need to grow the economy in the right way. And we need the right kind of economic uh, growth path. We need to grow the economy in a way that's inclusive. So that's the first thing. We really need to grow the economy. Because when we grow the economy, we'll have enough resources by the tax system or otherwise to be able to provide this kind of dignity. So for me, uh, the, the vehicle for doing that is growing the economy. You know, that's the vehicle to, to uh, delivering this dignity. And my final question is, what is the best piece of advice among many you have ever been given? Well, um, I should... What's the best piece of advice I've ever been given? I think uh, res respect, respecting others, right? Uh, you know, respecting those around you. For me, I think it's something that I try to remind myself every day, you know, that I have to remind myself that, uh, you know, I might have a PhD or whatever it is. I might have, you know, I might have traveled. I might have read this and that. At the end of the day, I have to have respect for those around me. So for me, respecting others, this is a lesson from my mother. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, oh, my mother always told me, you know, you need to respect those around you. It's very important. So respect for others, I think, is the is the, is the one lesson that I, I I keep carrying with me. If I if Martin could allow me to throw one more in in there, uh, mm -hmm. authenticity, being authentic. <laughs> is something Say more that about I, that. <laughs> I think being yourself, you know, being comfortable in your own skin, yeah. in your own nationality, in your own part of the world in your own lack of development, in your own lack of, you know, just being comfortable and authentic. There's something quite quite impressive in that. I, when I look at history, I see that our, many of our first post-independence leaders try to be authentic. Respect and authenticity. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Chelwa, thank you very much for gifting us with your reflections. I wish you well as you conduct your research, as you engage leaders in the economic and political spheres to try and help them take the systems they are privileged to lead to dignity. And that will remain a core lesson on my own journey. 
dignity. Thank you so much for your time and wisdom. Thank you, Martin. It's been a pleasure. It's been fun talking to you. Having listened to the dialogue and followed my conversation with our guest, I now invite you to look at the drawing that emerged out of that dialogue. Take time to see the contours, the colors, the images that are reflected on the painting, on the drawing. And pay attention to what the drawing evokes in you. What are the feelings? What are the thoughts? that are ignited by you looking at the painting. What thoughts, feelings and images does this painting evoke in you with regard to the future of our country? Kindly share your reflections on this channel so that we can continue the dialogue on the future of the country we all love.